right, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I hope that you're all staying healthy and safe. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Rachel Clark, and I am a president of Fresno Audubon Society. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. We have a very exciting presentation in store for us tonight. Gary Woods, who is an amazing birder and photographer, is going to be showcasing some of his um, bird photos and videos from the past 12 months. But before we get to that, I want to just talk to you guys briefly about a few different things. Uh, first, the field trip situation. We had planned on holding another virtual trip uh, this coming Saturday, December 12th, out at the River Center in North Fresno. But unfortunately, due to the new COVID restrictions, uh, we had to cancel that event. Uh, we will be monitoring the situation closely, and when the restrictions ease and it is safer to do so, uh, we will reschedule that trip. Uh, we want to thank everyone who joined us for the uh, virtual trip on November 21st to the uh, wastewater treatment plant um, west of Fresno. Despite the dense fog working against us, we did man manage to see in here some good birds. So definitely stay tuned for updates on the field trip situation. We are very anxious to get back out there and bring the birds to you as soon as possible. Uh, uh, just to let you guys know, Fresno Audubon has an Amazon wish list. On it are a few items to support our, our efforts for our birding uh, by ear series, such as a microphone, a phone, phone holder, and the lights. If you do choose to contribute, uh, please uh, do so via Amazon Smile. Um, an email with further details and the link uh, will be coming soon. Now, um, I'm sure that many of you in attendance tonight are probably already Fresno Audubon members. Uh, for those of you who are not, there are definitely um, a lot of good reasons to join. And here with us to talk about membership is Nancy Greaster. Nancy, I give the floor to you. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Um, first, I want to thank all of you who have already paid membership dues to Fresno Audubon uh, for the membership year that uh, begins on September 1st and runs through August for the following year. Fresno Audubon is a very active chapter and we couldn't do what we do without your annual support. If your dues aren't yet current for this year, you can go to the Fresno Audubon Society website and I put it on the chat and I've also got a very low tech way of showing you um, and click on the word membership. There, those of you with pin pa PayPal accounts can join or renew online. I already practiced with him, so I'm fine. <laughs> Am I not fine? Okay, close enough. And it's also on the chat area. Um, those who prefer to pay by check can click on the word here in the same page to download a membership form that can be mailed along with your check. And as I said, the, the same information is on chat for you to have find it. Thank you everyone. And now back to you, Rachel. All right, thank you very much, Nancy. And without uh, further delay, I am gonna hand the floor off to Gary Woods. You guys probably don't know, you probably can't tell, but this is my first Zoom meeting. And uh, Robert's done his best to coach me. So we'll see how well he did. Um, we got off to kind of a late start in 2020. <clears throat> Didn't really get going on the bird photography till March. But I started off with uh, some turkeys at uh, Martin Preserve, the uh, Sierra Fellow Conservancy near um, Millerton and uh, there you go. Good deal. And we had, uh, I don't know, about 20 or 30 turkeys up there. And there was four uh, gobblers hanging around this one hen and she was walking around behind them, checking out their fans and getting them all excited and they'd vibrate their wings and everything. So I had a good time uh, photographing those in March. Um, and I did a little local shooting and uh, that's from Roding Park on a cloudy day. A lot of wood ducks there and also at Woodward Park, you can find a lot of those. And they're fairly tame, especially when somebody's throwing out breadcrumbs. Um, I'm gonna try to get my chat screen up too here. Just bear with me just a second. I had it.
Hmm. I don't see my chat window anymore. Okay. Anywho, we'll keep on moving. Um, I went up to Woodland and the uh, Yellow Bypass. There's a wildlife area up there. It's great for birding and they have a, a year round uh, driving loop and uh, it's called Vic Fazio. And um, I didn't realize it was, I know there was yellow headed blackbirds in the springtime, but in March, I was amazed at how many were in there. They were kind of staging and I never saw, I never saw any females. I don't know, they were all males out in this field uh, feeding, but uh, it was a nice cloudy day and I drove around loop twice, uh, photographing out of my truck off of a bean bag. And uh, that Vic Fazio is a great place to go. It's only a, it's about a three hour drive from here. And about that time of year, you see a lot of Frugans hawks. They're just about ready to start heading north in March. And uh, usually don't see many in April. It's pretty rare in April here, but I managed to find one in, uh, in the foothills. Uh, I made a... This was at uh, off of Marks, just north of Shaw Avenue in the ponding basin, back behind that target there. And that's a red fox. And I saw five pups come out. There might've been more in there for all I know, but apparently they were living pretty well off of Canada geese or whatever. <laughs> So I was just off uh, north of uh, Shaw, uh, west of Marks, and there's a little side street you can park in and look over the concrete wall and see right into the den. That's where I took this video from. Um, made a little trip down to Butterbread Spring in April. Got down there, found out they'd closed the whole area down. But uh, I snuck in there and got a little bit of uh, photography done and then got out. It's a brewer sparrow on territory singing. And I really like going down there for mountain quail in April. I think there was about five that I could hear at once from different parts of the canyon there in Butterbrett Spring. It's down in Kern Canyon, or Kern County in the um, Jawbone Canyon area. Um, the big thing was in, in, I retired last year and I've never been to Arizona in uh, springtime. I've always gone there, well, both my grandparents uh, both sets of grandparents lived in Tucson. So we'd always go there once a year, either summer vacation or Christmas holidays. So I've never been there in the spring and I've been there, what I figure out today, 15 times in the last 16 years uh, birding, but it's always been like second week in August. So I was really looking forward to going there in the springtime and getting some warblers on territory, which I've never been able to do. And, um, the few weeks before I was planning on going down there, they discovered three crescent chested warblers, which are really rare. I think there's only, that might've been the fifth Arizona record, I'm not sure. But they're normally in Northern Mexico, all the way down in Central Mexico. And uh, so it was gonna be a lifer and he happened to be in the Chiricahuas right where I was headed. So I made a, a beeline down there, it was about a 12 hour drive and um, camped out on, uh, on uh, right 100 yards away from their territory where the end of the road was and, and found them the next morning. And there was two males and a female. And they're a lot like uh, Northern Perilla, a lot, real similar. Uh, so I got that for a lifer to start the trip off. And then my big target for the trip was, number one was olive warbler which I've never gotten a decent shot of, just distant shots in August. And I was trying to get Montezuma's quail uh, while they were 
pairing up when the males would be more uh, likely to come in and hop up on a rock and let you, you know, take a picture of them. Well, it turned out I was about a month late, I think, for the Montezuma's quail because I only found three pairs. Uh, they were just absent. And uh, the only ones I found were in one spot and uh, I found three pairs on the roadside. So I think next year my target is going to be Mazim's quail, but I'm going in into March because I've seen videos of the guys whistling them in with their mouth in Mar on March 28th in the Chiricahua. So that was a month too late for them, but I did get a little bonus coming down the back down the hill from the uh, Crescent Chester Warbler site. The turkeys were strutting. This is a Gould's turkey, which is um, well, a subspecies that's fairly rare in the U.S. and they're, they've been planted in the southeastern part of Arizona. And he was, every time that hen would turn toward him, he'd, he'd do that. When she'd look away, he'd relax. <laughs> it's just he wasn't having any luck, but uh, he gave me some pretty good shots. I photoshopped in one of his uh, missing tail feathers there. I took a little artist liberty. And uh, yeah, there was Cordillera and fly catchers on territory, uh, remarkably similar to, well, they used to be uh, considered the same thing as uh, uh, Pacific Slope fly catcher. And um, quite a few, for a million fly catchers with I love, I, I had a really good shot of this one. And one I, I hadn't shot before, uh, really good in Arizona. I, I've heard them, I hear them all the time, but I never went after them. This time it's pretty easy, dusky cap fly catcher. And uh, look a lot like an astro, they're in the same genus, but um, quite a bit smaller. And painted red starts, they were all over the place. The, I had one family come in on me when I was chasing olive warblers and I had to keep backing up. They were just too close to focus. And um, finally got my male olive warbler like I was uh, shooting for. And I had a little bonus on that, that hillside. I had uh, quite a few red-faced warblers that were on territory. So just sat still for a while. It's pretty easy to uh, shoot and this is about 20 feet away on the end of a, uh, a stump that had a big root ball sticking up so it was pretty cool. Oh, let me pause this. This is the first day I went to North Dakota in June. I've been wanting to go to North Dakota for a long time and I got there on June 16th after two days of driving, 12 hours both days and this is what I encountered and I thought man I'm never going to get I, how if this wind doesn't settle down I'm never going to get any photography done and uh, it did fortunately but that day I, I did get a little bit of shooting I found a, a spot kind of out of the wind and was able to videotape this clay colored sparrow on territory Yeah, that was that was worth the drive though. I, that's a big state. I, I uh, birded three parts of the state. I didn't do the eastern part, east of the Missouri River, but uh, I started out in Bismarck for three days in the center of the state, and then I went up to Minot for three days, and then I went back down to Bowman County in the southwest corner, and um, I wished I had another day down there to do uh, some of the grasslands better, but um, Eastern Kingbird, I've only seen one of these in my life down in San Diego. I never heard one call before either.
they were all over the place. Not hard to find at all, right on the edge of the roads. And uh, a lot of these guys out in the grasslands, bobolinks. really neat birds. I uh, didn't get chestnut collared longspur. I saw them and I thought they'd be pretty easy to get and I left it till the end of the trip and I couldn't find them in uh, the last grassland I went into right on the Montana border. Um, so I, I struck out on that. I, I found Sprague's pipit there fortunately though. You'll see that in a minute. Uh, but along the Missouri River gray cat birds pretty easy to get. Um, Yellow-breasted chat wasn't very hard. Uh, brown thrashers, eastern peewee, eastern wood peewee, I should say. Uh, this was in Denby Experimental Forest. That was probably my favorite place in North Dakota that I went birding. It's just spectacular. I don't know if it's 120 acres or 80 acres or what it is, but it's you pretty much have it to yourself, and it's all different stages of growth. The, the bird life is there is just phenomenal. It's just incredible. I could have spent two days photographing in there. Brown thrashers, they were pretty easy to see just about anywhere. There's a lot of wind breaks in North Dakota and almost all the wind breaks seemed like they had some North, some brown thrashers. Uh, common grackle, they were all over the marshes. Really beautiful bird. Fortunately, I, I got this one close on a cloudy day really shows that iridescence. This black cap chickadees in the background. This was from a park on the south side of Minot that is just phenomenal. I could have spent two days there too. It's a beautiful park, manicured, incredible amount of bird habitat. Uh, and that was my first red-eyed vireo. That was a lifer. And then uh, after I got this photo, I switched to video mode and got him on video. But once I figured out what they sounded like, I, I ran into red, red eyed vireos all over the place. They're just everywhere. Um, same, same park. This is right by a, a campsite for trailers. There's two or three of them actually in this, uh, this spot. American Red Start. It's like he's starting to bolt a little bit too, or he's just really feather worn. But it, it was June. And uh, in that Denby experimental forest, there was uh, yellow bellied sap suckers. And uh, all the grasslands have these little guys. They're called 13 lined ground squirrels. Pretty cute. I, I really enjoyed seeing those on the edge of the road. I finally took took time to photo, uh, video one of them. Um, of course, it's known for pheasants and um, didn't disappoint. I didn't see very many really, but the ones I did were just parading around out in the open. And so uh, I took this shot from the truck. This was a lifer.
Yeah, it's hard to hear them, but the uh, they sound a lot like a, a Swainson thrush. They're real closely related. That was my life for Veery in that Denby experimental forest, and uh, there was three or four of them in there on territory. They were pretty easy to to get to come down and sit on a, a fallen tree for me. So I think I got four lifers on that trip. I didn't get as many as I thought. This was also from Denby Experimental Forest. Um, I think I had three or four of these yellow throated vireos. And it would have been a lifer, but I looked back and I saw one in Texas back in 2007. One day when I was in Minot, I took a trip up toward the Canada border and I was about a mile from there. And it had rained the night before and pretty heavy undergrowth, a lot of aspens and these little potholes out in the forest with dead trees in them and stuff. Almost every one had redneck greaves nesting in them. And uh, after a while, I was able to get down and sneak in on the shoreline and get this uh, this one of the pair before he took off. Um, this was my lifer ruby-throated hummingbird. I'd never seen one of those before. They're mainly east of the Rockies, I guess, or no. I can't, I can't remember what their range is, but in the East, that's mainly the hummingbird. You know, I've seen 11 in one spot in Arizona and they get like one in Missouri. And that's that, that's the bird. Up in the North part of the state where the pothole, prairie pothole country is a lot of ducks nesting, but I was kind of surprised. I, I, I probably read it, but I forgot that Wilson's fallow ropes are breeding in these shallow little, um, ponds that are just rainwater to snow melt. And the other thing that shocked me was I'd have, I'd be approaching one of these things and I'd have marbled godwits and willets flying out and screaming at me and harassing me, um, trying to drive me away from the pond because they had nests around there. So I, it was weird. It was like, you know, being at the sewer ponds, uh, had these Wilson's fellow females and Never saw any males. I'm sure they were sitting on eggs somewhere. And I don't know if these gals were nesting up there, if they were heading south already for maybe Jeff Davis and Jeff C would know. But um, really surprising to see Willets and Marble Godwood screaming and flying at you out in the middle of the North Dakota prairie. And this was my Sprague's Pippet day. Thought they were gonna be very, very hard. It turned out I, I hit the right spot and had two and um, wasn't too hard to get a shot of them. It's pretty open country where this guy was. And this was a lifer is up on a Missouri River uh, field sparrow. I didn't know if I'd be able to find one. And when I finally hit the right habitat, uh, I found like six. Uh, it was another real windy day. I had to get down behind a hill to uh, get a shot of this guy. And this was one of my favorite birds up there. I didn't think I'd see one. I've been chasing them, trying to find one for years down in Southeast Arizona and New Mexico and August and keep missing them. And, and I went three or four days in North Dakota and I hadn't seen them. I thought they'd be all over the place. And finally I, I got one one day and then the day before I left, uh, there was several on the, on the highway actually and I pulled partway off the highway and there's nobody coming. So I got down on my knees and uh, handheld a 600 millimeter and I was shooting this up in Sandpiper courting a female off the left edge there. And when I got back from North Dakota, they finally lifted the uh, uh, prohibition against birders at the Fresno sewer pond. So I made a beeline out there in July and found this beautiful pond. And you might not think it's beautiful, but it's beautiful. This is what I dream of. And you get these in July, August, September. And yeah, you have to sort through a few thousand shorebirds. 
and you don't you're not getting good at it unless you do it a lot and i i never figured out for a long time how a person could ever scope this many birds and jeff davis finally told me how to keep both eyes open when you look for a spotting scope and that helped quite a bit but now i just scan them with my binoculars and if i see something interesting then i can zoom in with a scope and you're looking for any kind of rarity out there you know like uh semi-palmated sandpiper or uh, maybe a bared sandpiper marble godwit maybe stilt sandpiper you got to sort through all those dowagers and peeps and stuff and and um, usually before you finish scanning a whole flock that size, a paragon will come in and blow everything up and you have to start over again. But every once in a while you get lucky and find something like this Willet. I think this is in, uh, I can't remember if it's in July, or early August. But usually we only get one or two a year here in Fresno. And one of the reasons not many people bird the sewer ponds in July and August is, and even in September is uh, the midges. It's not steam, that's insects. And uh, they look just like a large mosquito, except they don't have mouth parts, so they can't bite you. They're very delicate if you try to flick them off of your upholstery usually you end up mashing them into the uh, upholstery so i just i just close up the windows when i park in the garage and they all die overnight and uh, i blow them out with a leaf blower later but this is what all the birds are attracted to is the larval form of these um, midges and they hatch by the billions uh, they hatch in alkaline uh, mud as it warms up and as these ponds recede and expose that uh, mud to the, uh, the sun's rays, these midges hatch. So all these little sandpipers are probing the mud for the larval form of these, among other things. Of course, it supports a huge spider population. This is one of the dry canals on the edge of the uh, sewer pond complex. And you see some semi-palmated plovers there uh, for about a six week period. They're usually pretty easy to find. And you get a lot of juvenile Western sandpipers that are pretty rufous scapulars. And, and, uh, and then about August, you start looking hard for short-billed dowagers. I can't tell the short-billed uh, adult from a long-billed adult, but the juveniles are pretty easy because they've had this, uh, these, on these secondaries, they have these orange bars on the edge. And if that was a long billed juvenile, it'd be solid gray or solid uh, dark gray, blackish. So I always look for that kind of orange tiger striping on those secondaries. And if it's a juvenile plumage, which this is, although he's starting to, starting to molt some of these gray feathers here are winter feathers and i'm kind of surprised by that because i was understanding that they molt in their wintering grounds not on migration so maybe i've got an adult here i don't know maybe somebody can correct me later and of course with all those birds it brings in uh, peregrine falcons i think the most i've had out there was three at once this year and uh, of course a lot of other raptors come in like red-tailed hawks and Sometimes there's a conflict. Yeah, he, he didn't do any damage, but he gave him a scare. I think the red tail came in and stole the uh, the bird that the peregrine was feeding on. So I came in and mopped up there with my camera. And once while you get a vagrant from Clovis that shows up out in the mud flats, uh, kind of out of range, a little bit far west of his territory, but. Uh, you're always happy to see these these rare vagrants. This happens to be Rick Saxton. And he's one of these crazy guys that likes to sit there and put a scope up on a mud flat and 
look at it for an hour. And then at certain times of year, we get a lot of white pelicans coming in. I'm not sure what they're feeding on. It looks like something large, but I, other than tadpoles, I don't know what would be large. Mosquito fish, maybe, I don't know how big they get, but they just, their technique is to kind of herd everything into a small spot and then trap them in one little location and take a mouthful of water and sort it out. Totally different from a brown pelican. It plunges from way up high and dives down in her beak first. And I have no idea what these egrets and herons were feeding on. This is the end of one of the concrete canals at the sewer ponds. And it was like this for a couple of weeks. And I don't know whether it was, it was also um, mosquito fish or some kind of a larvae uh, grub. I have no idea, but boy, there was a whole lot of them. I just was going down a canal in Madeira and I saw this sore out in the open feeding too. I, I can't, I have no idea what it was feeding on either. It seemed to be kind of picky, but you just don't see sores out in the open very often. So I had to shoot him. Love Suarez. Oh, in September, there was uh, uh, actually this is in October uh, on my birthday. Rick Saxon and I took off and went down to Santa Barbara uh, to Goleta. And on the beach there below UC Santa Barbara was this Curlew Sandpiper juvenile. And he'd been down there for a few weeks. He was losing some of his uh, buffy breast band by the time we got it down there, I should have gone down earlier. But he still had this kind of greenish oily sheen to his secondaries and tertials and really pretty bird. Uh, about the same size as a Dunlin, looks a lot like a Dunlin. But boy, the beak is just uh, another notch bigger than a Dunlin. Of course, he's got different plumage than a Dunlin. So the uh, Curlew Sandpiper is a lifer um, for Rick. And I had just seen one a few weeks earlier and I'd been trying to find one for 15 years. So it was kind of a neat deal to get two of them in one year. Um, and he's still down there on the beach at uh, Santa Barbara. If somebody wants to go down there and chase him. It's about a three hour, three hour, 15 minute drive. And when we got into September, uh, we were finding uh, neotropic cormorants in Fresno, which is the first. Uh, Elias Elias uh, found some and um, a couple. And uh, when we were at the spawning basin looking at the neotropic cormorant, I looked up on the power line, there was a juvenile purple martin. And uh, they're pretty darn rare in the Central Valley. Um, you get them on migration. You can tell it's a juvenile by the streaks on the grass. So I took a picture, fortunately. And the next week, I happened to see one at the uh, Fresno sewer ponds. I got a picture of that one. And then I got one flying over my head in Madeira at the Madeira Canal, like a week after that. So it was like three purple Martin year, and I'd gone 10 years at least without seeing one in the county. So it was a good year for them if you were in the right spot. And, you know, that's our usual double crest cormorant. But, but uh, the last few years, we've been having a northward migrate, kind of a range expansion of a neotropic cormorant, which is about half the size. And they have this uh, small yellow throat patch with a white border, the adult does. And so it looks almost like a coot sitting in amongst a flock of, of uh, double crests. I didn't get any really good still shots. Um, they were quite a ways away. Uh, there was a juvenile and an adult and they showed up in Orange Cove. 
and then later on, um, Kevin Ann's Rempel and his son found uh, one at um, uh, all that lake. Uh, I'll think of it. But this is a video I shot from the truck of the Neotropic on the right there. He's playing with a rock or something. I don't know what he's doing, but you can see the size difference. I mean, it, look at him compared to the coot in the background. He's just a little bit bigger. I think it might be smaller than the mallard. And if you can spot it, you can see a white border behind that yellow throat patch. So hopefully someday we'll soon we'll be able to find one in Madeira because they seem to be moving northward. There was one in the uh, foothills east of Modesto, I believe, or Stockton or Modesto. I get them confused uh, earlier this summer. Neotropic cormorant. And I happen to uh, surprise a barn owl. This is the yellow background was actually smoke. It was one of those days when we had so much smoke in here from the fires. I lightened it up as much as I could. And this was down at Rivers at um, Sycamore Island when I was going in one morning to do a survey. Hardly ever see barn owls out in the daylight. I don't know how he got so wet either. It wasn't raining. But if you're gonna sit there long enough, I'll shoot you. Uh, this was over uh, a few weeks ago at um, San Luis Reservoir. And you don't usually get close to loggerhead strikes. And uh, whenever I get close to one, I'm, I feel fortunate. Pretty neat birds. Yeah, I think this bufflehead was over in um, Santa Cruz. I just got back from Santa Cruz last week. <clears throat> there, um, there was a white wagtail at the San Lorenzo River mouth, and it was alternating between there and a nearby spot in Santa Cruz called Corcoran Lagoon. So I, I left early. Well, actually, the day before. I went to San Luis looking for a red-throated loon and I missed out, didn't get him. And so the next morning, like an idiot, I, I decided to push my luck and I went over to Santa Cruz and bingo, first bird I saw at San Lorenzo was this white wagtail. And in the lagoon, there was a, a bunch of buffalo heads and so they were pretty easy to shoot. And that's the first one I've ever shot that I didn't overexpose with whites. But this is looking out toward the ocean and panning back. You'll see the Santa Cruz Beach boardwalk right there. And there's a little puddle of water uh, flowing out sideways from the lagoon from the San Lorenzo, San Lorenzo River. And that's an old railroad trestle up there. And I came in from a parking area right back here and walked underneath the bridge and there's a homeless guy with a tent on the beach over there on the left. And then right against that cliff, this is 7.40 in the morning, sun hadn't even hit it yet. Right down in here, I saw a movement of white and I got the binoculars on it, it was that wagtail. And he flew across the river, calling the whole way, I never heard one call, and he landed of all places on top of the big tent by the Ferris wheel and all that stuff, all the amusement rides. And he was just checking things out, I guess, looking for danger. So I sat down on the sand and waited with my camera. And pretty soon he came down and landed in that little puddle and started foraging for bugs. Here he comes. He decided the coast is clear and then boom, chakalaka, here he comes. And I just let him run around and uh, you can see a little strip of sunlight just starting to show behind him in that water. But that was a lifer for me. And uh, pretty cool bird, there's not, there was one in uh, farther south on the coast 
earlier in the year. I know Jeff C went and saw it. I, I can't remember if it was San Luis, San Luis Obispo County, and that was a lifer for him. And I might have been a third one. Um, and we go years sometimes without seeing a wagtail in California. Normally they're down in like Asia and North Africa and stuff for the winter. So quite a quite a rare bird. It's pretty cool going over there. And then on the way back, I stopped by San Luis Reservoir again, paid another $10 and gave it an hour of looking for that red throated loon and I couldn't find it. And I put my camera away and said, screw this. And I started heading out and I come over a rise and there he is 50 yards off the shore looking at me. And do you think he let me get my camera together? <laughs> Heck no. I got a shot of him flying out in the middle of the, of the uh, reservoir, but uh, at least I, I got two good birds in one day though. And the big, big highlight of the year for me was um, in September 27th, uh, this vermilion flycatcher female, I found her on the Madeira Canal again. Uh, it, we found her in November of 2017, and it was a first county record. We've never had a vermilion flycatcher in Madeira County. We've had six or seven or eight in Fresno. And I knew they'd be in Madeira. It's just a question of everything's private. And they're always around water whenever I see them. Uh, even down in the Sonora Desert, they're always within 100 yards of water, it seems like. Not always, but 99% of the time. So this little female, she came back again. This is, um, she missed last year, I believe. So 2017, 2018, she returned. 2019, she was gone. Couldn't find her. And then 2010, she's back. 2020, she's back. So it's quite a highlight. And she's still there. And, and she's within 100 yards, a little 100 yard circle. She stays in this one little spot. I don't know why. So that's about it for up till up, you're up to date on 2020, my photography adventures. And uh, hopefully we won't have uh, COVID restrictions and all this trouble I had um, health wise next year. Get some more good pictures for uh, next year's presentation. So Gary, can you get the chat window open now and, and answer some of the questions that? Yeah. Uh, I thought I could, Robert. Should be down at the bottom of your screen. I got it. Okay. Uh, the wood duck, uh, I think I mentioned it was uh, Roding Park. It's right across where you park to go in the entrance to the zoo. It was always, and that's a good time to go, a good place to go and look for um, uh, hooded mergansers too. In fact, I've been meaning to go on a cloudy day and see if I can get some photos. Only problem with that is you, good bird photos, in case you don't know this, is you try to get eye level with your bird. Uh, if you're shooting up or down on a bird, it's not usually as pleasing in general. And so to get good shots of wood ducks and hooded mergansers, you want to get down flat on the ground or as close to as you can. Problem with the parks is there's a lot of, you know what, goose uh, sign uh, where you have to lay down. So I always bring a towel with me and kind of fling it around to kind of knock some of that out of the way and then sit on my towel and uh, planning ahead when you try to shoot uh, birds from a low angle at a park. Uh, foxes, yeah, wood duck, roading park. Arizona, I usually, my base is Tucson. And I'll stay in a Holiday Inn Express on I-10 at, at uh, I think it's Grant Avenue. And I just get a room for six days, seven days, eight days, whatever. And um, anywhere I want to go in Southeast Arizona is within a two to two and a half hour drive. It takes about two hours to get into the Chiricahuas, way in the Southeast corner near Wilcox. Um, that's probably one of the better places to go for uh, 
uh, Montezuma's quail. And right now there's an eared trogon or a couple of them in there. I'd like, I've thought about going there this month and I haven't done it. That would be a life for, that's where the uh, crescent chest warblers were. Uh, like um, Nogales on the border is only 50 minutes maybe, right down I-19. I uh, it's just, you know, Tucson is the hub for when I go down there to photograph because I can leave at five o'clock, uh, grab, there's, there's a, a lot of 24 hour gas stations with good donuts and coffee and you can be on the road in 20 minutes and gone. And um, usually I'll spend eight to 10 hours out in the field, photograph and come home, get a shower, download the pictures and, and uh, usually I don't process anything until I get back to Fresno. But I just, I love going down there and I don't fear smugglers or, you know, trouble from, um, you know, immigrants. It's really the only thing I worry about down there is, is having an accident or rattlesnakes. And I'm, in 15 trips down there, I've run into two rattlesnakes. One of them was way across the dry wash. I don't know what his problem was. He was, he was still 20 yards away and he was rattling. The one last year though, in August, I almost stepped on her and I don't know who was more surprised me or her. And she went back and up into a coil and I went stumbling sideways and tripping on my camera. And I went down in a heap in the rocks. And so, you know, if you're worrying about rattlesnakes in Arizona, you're gonna have to probably try pretty hard to get into one because they're smarter than we are. I think they know we're coming. Uh, the videos, I took them with my 7D2, my Canon Mark uh, uh, 7D2. And it's not the greatest for holding the focus. Um, you want to have a, a bird that's pretty stable. And I use a center point focus and I put it on video mode. And boy, a lot of times it jumps off and loses focus. It's really hard, especially if the wind is blowing. I can't believe I got that. Uh, clay colored sparrow whipping around in the wind in North Dakota. That was amazing. I can't, that thing shocked me. But it's a 600 millimeter lens to, on a tripod. And I don't take a lot of video because it, it's not forgiving as far as keeping the focus. So usually it's singing birds on in one spot. That's what you'll see from me with video. The uh, fox, however, was done with a handheld uh, little Canon 50. Um, SX as a flip out LCD screen. Um, they came out with a 60 and then a 90, I think. So there's a several different upgraded versions of my little handheld Canon 50 SX, but uh, takes great video. Uh, Yeah. Well, this is administrative uh, between Robert and people that are having trouble. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I, uh, one of these days, oh, Jim Teets, yeah. Yeah, too bad I didn't get a photograph of your warbler, Jim, did I? I can't remember if I did or not. Jim Teets got first county record. Uh, I can't remember what it was now. <laughs> I got stage fright. Um, anyway, that was a lot of fun doing my first uh, Zoom. It didn't go as bad as some I've seen from some of the other Audubon groups. I'll tell you, some of them were pretty bad. And you can tell some of the geezers are, are more technically challenged than I was. So Robert, you did a great job getting us through it all. And I'm actually feeling brave enough to do another one down the road. Well, thank you, Gary. Like a, maybe like a top 50. Sounds good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And um, everybody, everybody mm -hmm. says thank you. And I, I'd like to uh, turn the floor back over to um, Rachel. All right. 
And well, thank you again, Gary. That was a wonderful presentation. And I have to say it absolutely um, heightened my wanderlust. And I'm just, I'm just itching to get out there and uh, travel somewhere outside of California and get some lifers. I haven't been able to do that for a while. And um, I'm very, very envious of your uh, photography. Um, I feel like a little chunk with my little uh, Canon power shot. So hopefully someday I'll get to upgrade. Uh, um, yeah, thank you very much. That was awesome. And thank you to everyone who attended. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, if you're not already, uh, please follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and also on YouTube. Uh, we recently relaunched the channel. So for those of you who are asking about watching this presentation again, we will. It has, it's being recorded, and it will soon be posted to YouTube. So definitely uh, check that out and stay tuned for that. And yeah, um, keeping up with us on social media is a great way to stay informed about meetings, uh, field trips, different volunteer opportunities. And of course, we're also posting um, fun and educational content. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, please stay healthy and safe out there and have a great remainder of your week. Good night, everyone.